I'd like to introduce Bill Baddeley from the URI Master Gardeners, and he's going to give a presentation today on beginner vegetable gardening, which I know it's kind of crazy to start thinking about vegetable gardening when there's snow on the ground, but better to start sooner rather than later. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm a URI Master Gardener volunteer with the University Extension. Um, I took the, uh, the initial training course in 2014. So coming up on 10 years into it next year. Um, the University, the Master Gardener program is a piece of the University Extension, uh, which was set up in 1914 to get better information from universities that ran agronomy departments and odds and ends of scientific uh, lines that could be of value to farmers and homeowners and citizens generally, most, mostly focused on farmers. And um, it's branched out now more recently uh, to cover you know, uh, healthy lifestyles, uh, you know, basics of, of canning and food storage, um, food systems, water resources, all these things. Now, you'll be able to see a copy of these slides after we're done. And uh, so you don't need to worry too much about content or more words than you can read in the time. Uh, so let's see, Master Gardeners, uh, are essentially about working with home gardeners and public generally on practices. <clears throat> we run a number of demonstration gardens around the state. Uh, there's one at the uh, Roger Williams Botanical Garden uh, within the Roger Williams Park. And uh, there's also a permaculture garden at that site. So these are uh, if you know the park, there's a botanical center with greenhouses, and if you are at the greenhouses and you go toward the the uh, the water, the lakes out there, then it, as you go down the slope, that's where those two gardens are. There's a demonstration garden and community garden and also a uh, uh, permaculture garden off to the side. Right. We do presentations, we do soil pH testing, we do all sorts of uh, things, including tours and open gardens and things like that, that you can find out about. And the easiest way to do that is probably to get on our mailing list. So, um, and if, so there'll be some support material. There's a resource sheet um, that you'll also see at the end of this. Uh, but if you ever have a gardening question, this may be the most important slide in the whole presentation. The, um, the university uh, gardener, uh, it's, it's essentially run by master gardeners with the backup of university extension staff who can uh, go into you know, more difficult problems. Uh, and you can call during the growing season, you can call the number. Uh, during the rest of the year and all year round, you can send us some email at gardener at uri.edu and uh, we'll get you answers to the questions. It's a very dedicated program. The people that are generally involved in that work are well-trained, well-backed up with uh, data, and you know, really don't like to let a problem go before they've got you an answer. And we also have a soil testing service, pH soil texture report uh, would come back to you. You can drop uh, samples at uh, the university. Uh, there are also public engagements, times when, when there's a soil testing uh, crew at um, you know, a garden center or um, at the botanical centers and things. So you can find out about that on our website. Right, and you can also become a master gardener if you're so inclined, and uh, you can read about that on the web page. 
So what do plants need? So, the, so again, as, as we go through this, it's, it's impossible really to give you a, a, an in-depth, sufficient understanding of the of vegetable gardening that you could kind of turn around and go outside and do it. Um, but we'll get as close as, as we can in a talk. And uh, there'll be, again, on the resources list, there is a free, uh, excellent home gardening manual from the University of Kentucky. The climate is quite similar to our own, and uh, it's extremely well done. Uh, it's a group of, of faculty that have kept this thing up, and they re-release it with uh, updates every year or two. Uh, so, University of Kentucky Home Gardening Manual. Uh, if you ever have a problem, you'd probably find the answer in there. And if not, give us a call, send us an email. So, what do plants need? Well, they, they vegetable plants, almost all of them really like to have six to eight hours of uh, full sun a day. Now, you can get away with some lettuces and, and things that, that can get by with a bit less than that. But if you're trying to grow a tomato, then you really need more like the eight hours if you can possibly get it. So the simplest way to find out how much of a, a clear sun sweep you're going to have in your garden on your site is to raise your hand up like uh, about 75 degrees and face south, point south, and then you know, sort of see how much of that space is going to have the sun in it uh, during your day. The other thing plants like is to have air all around them. So we all know that that they're processing, you know, the elements of the air, but uh, sometimes not clear that plants also breathe through their roots. And so we want to have water available to the plant all the time, but not so much water that the plant can't breathe. And so when we have a very heavy rain, it's, uh, it's important to let the soil drain before uh, we add any additional irrigation water, things like that. Um, they need soil. That's um, pretty obvious. You have a hard time planting them without it. And uh, the water, as I say, there's a knuckle test, finger test, it's called for um, water in your soil. And you basically just poke your finger in to about the first joint. And then if it comes out really muddy, that's very wet and you shouldn't do any more watering. If it comes out moist, that's, that's just about perfect. And if it comes out dry, then it's good to put another inch of water on the soil or whatever uh, looks like you can do a little more investigation and decide. And water of about one inch per week across the whole garden. Um, so if you have a week where, where there's an inch of rain, um, that's good and sufficient. Um, you can also turn a can of some description and a ruler into a rain gauge. And if you leave that out, you'll be able to tell how, uh, how much rain you've had. You can also look at the weather service, but your own garden may actually be at substantial variance uh, with the numbers reported at the airport, that observed at the airport. So um, it's a good idea uh, to keep a weather or a rain gauge on your own garden. All right, so the plants. There's, the first thing is, what are you going to grow? And the first rule is grow vegetables that your family and you are going to like, uh, the people you live with what were they most welcome? And uh, some of these plants grow from seed. And some of them, because they're tropicals or subtropicals, need more time to get going than they will get if you plant them from seed outside. A tomato would be an absolute disaster. You know, you might get a really luxuriant uh, looking tomato plant only to have the first frost take it away. Um, so we start those in greenhouses or indoors. Um, and uh, if you're just starting out, the, the best thing is to visit a nursery and you know 
pick up some plants there. And uh, there are, of course, those that grow from last year's harvest, most, uh, most famously potatoes and garlic. They're the ones that you just chip off and go. Uh, so the first step then is to figure out what, what you think you'll plant and then take a look at a planting calendar and make your own uh, choices about when you'll plant things and you know what successions you might do. Uh, radishes followed by some lettuce or things like that. So, and the soil is where the plants hold themselves upright. Um, the roots are typically at least as long as the shoots and often much longer. Uh, the top layer of this soil is humus and uh, then we have soil strata below that. Um, and for some of us around Rhode Island, you know, we don't actually get to parent rock before we get to sand and water, but uh, this is generally, this is uh, the layering of soil. And the parent rock is actually um, what the plants start working on with new mountain ranges, you know, the algae and, uh, and small plants start to essentially wear their way into the rock. And after some lengthy period, uh, you'll find trees that have dropped into those crevices in the rock, splitting the rocks open. Anyway, that's how the rock gets fragmented. And then you've got soil layers that have built up over the generations from either the rock coming from the bottom or the uh, organic matter coming from the top. So humus is a spongy mass. If you go into a forest and take the soil, you know, just a handful of soil below the, the debris leaves and, and branches and things, you'll find that it's a it's spongy, it's light, and um, what it is is uh, organic and you know, sand and silt particles knit together with bacterial glue. Bacteria are really small and they would, if they didn't attach themselves to bigger things, be washed away with each rainfall. So they so they tend to exude this glue, and as they go, they build um, structured soil. And the, the humus is so dense and yet so light um, that three tablespoons some years back were examined by a professor of botany and no doubt a host of graduate students who tried to unfold humus to find out just how many little surfaces, you know, chambers were inside that. And they came up with a city block worth of surface area. And because there's little tiny, there are little tiny chambers, it holds water in uh, surface tension. And so even when it's been not raining for a while, uh, the plants can still find water. The roots can still find water in the humus. It also holds nutrients that might otherwise be washed away. Um, and it's where most of the live organisms in the soil uh, are to be found. And it's it, increasingly, even, even large-scale farmers are working gently with the top layer of soil because that's where so much of the life is. And uh, so they're doing essentially no-till agriculture. And we do no-till agriculture in beds where we've got some humus established. And that just basically each year you uh, take a spading fork or equivalent tool and poke it into the soil and just gently wiggle it back and forth to uh, open some air uh, pockets and give you enough uh, enough uh, movement in the soil that you can put the seeds down. So what do we need to do to get ready here? Well, we're going to need a site. We're going to need a soil test, uh, some plants and seeds, 
and a planting plan for putting them in the ground uh, and caring for them. A few tools, and the most important thing is probably a daily visit or as near as you can get to that, to the garden. Um, and support. And I think the between the uh, gardening manuals, there are a lot of good ones around. You can find them at the library. Uh, you can find them in bookstores. Um, you, know, you should basically, if you're interested, you can take a look and just see whatever seems attractive to you from where you are. But I highly recommend the University of Kentucky publication. Okay, so soil tests are important because um, you really want to know how many of the essential nutrients that a plant needs are in your soil. Now you can't really tell a lot about nitrogen because it uh, comes and goes, but when you take a soil sampler, there will be nitrogen there. It's just not a, anyway, I'm sorry. Forget about the nitrogen. Um, these are the elements of the soil that the plants really care about. And pH for vegetables is typically between six and a half and seven for an ideal uh, growing environment. And at that pH level, um, you, you've got the balance that allows the nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, and so on to be available to the plant roots. If you get much above seven into the alkaline spectrum, you, you're, uh, you're going to see reductions in uh, some of these elements. And similarly, if you go below six and a half, uh, you're starting to see calcium and, uh, and then further out, further out. So uh, this is important mostly because Rhode Island uh, is at the end of um, a glacier that left behind um, soil that was really um, pretty much on the acid side. So it's not uncommon in soil testing for us to see samples that are at five, uh, which if you look at the chart is uh, is going to make less of really important nutrients uh, available to plant roots. And I've personally tested samples that go below four and a half. And um, on the one hand, that does make it tough for the gardener to make the corrections, not impossible, but it's why blueberries grow so well. They really like acid soil. And so, you, you know, if you uh, have really acid soil, you might decide to grow blueberries there and try another spot somewhere else. But these are all correctable. So it, the, by following the directions that you'll get from a soil tester or from a laboratory soil test, you'll be able to correct those conditions over a couple of years. Although plants will still do reasonably well, just not as well as they might if the pH were uh, adjusted. And then uh, your fertilization plan needs to cover uh, the rest of these elements as well. Um, and I probably won't say a lot more about fertilizer, but you will be able to see that in the books. Uh, but this is why, if you haven't done it, it's a good idea to test the soil. Then, I'll just come back to this one more time. The The test laboratories at the University of Connecticut and University of Massachusetts will do a full uh, profile of the nutrients in the soil. They'll tell you what your soil level is and what they would expect to see, and they'll give you very specific recommendations for uh, adding fertilizer to the soil to correct those shortfalls. They'll also tell you if you got too much of something, but that's beside the point. So to start from scratch with a piece of lawn or you know, uh, differently employed soil, uh, you'll almost certainly need to do a little digging and uh, you have to loosen the soil up 
You may do that with a spade. You may do that with a fork. Um, and optionally, uh, you need to get the vegetation, top level of vegetation out of that as much as possible because you don't want to, to put back vegetation that's then going to be a competitor for your vegetable plants. In general, uh, vegetable plants don't compete with weeds because the weeds are native. The weeds are, you know, stronger, have fewer resource requirements, and, and uh, anyway. So if you loosen with a fork, you get a reasonable depth of several inches. If, if you're really keen to uh, make sure that the vegetation is, is, if not removed, even the parts that you can't see, little root fragments and so on, you can try double digging. That basically digs down about a foot, loosens up about a foot underneath it, and then restores the soil on the top. And generally, if you do that with a garden plot, it will be very productive for you know, the initial period, couple of years at least. But it's a lot of work. And you can find out how to do that by uh, just doing a search on double dig um, university extension will tend to give you more reliable tested results and methods, but whatever suits you. You can then, once the soil is sorted out, loosened up, rake the surface, then put an inch of compost over the top of it. And compost is important because it provides the microbes that will help build humus in your soil. And it also provides some nutrients. But mostly, if you make compost at home, uh, you, you will find that it helps build humus over time. And that's a very powerful incentive to put uh, compost on in the spring and fall. And then plant into the bed after raking it in uh, lightly into the surface. Okay. Caring for the soil. Well, we're going to need compost, mulch, and minimal disturbance. So um, you garden, you dig. Um, and once you start planting, once the plants have reached, you know, sort of a substantial height, varies from plant to plant, once the tomatoes have established themselves and you're not worried about, uh, about their strength anymore, uh, you can put a layer of mulch down. And the mulch will uh, help keep the soil moist. It will protect the, the plants from undue uh, sun heat. You don't want to get the soil too hot. And um, generally, it's, it's helpful for weed suppression as well. So it's a good idea if you can come up with it to put down chopped leaves, straw, uh, something that will shield the soil from the sun. Water, about an inch a week. And I mentioned the finger test. Um, and then in autumn, we mulch for the winter because the winter's tough on, on soil. And if you can possibly cover it with some compost and, uh, and plant debris mulch, uh, it, will, it will have a, an easier time recovering in the spring. All right. And once you've got a bed established with a layer of hummus on the humus on the top, not hummus, humus, um, don't walk on it anymore. So when you make garden beds, you should make them no more than about four feet wide, because if you do, then you can't reach in to the center. And if you can't do that, then you're more likely to end up putting your foot in it. Um, moving on here. So there's a lot of life underneath a meter of ground. And this is just an illustration of just how many of, uh, how many of these per square meter of ground are you know, in the profile of the soil as you drop through. And again, most of these animals and uh, bacteria live in the top layers, in the, the humus layers. Um, there's 
other life, the bacterial interaction with uh, plants, the famous rhizobacteria that, that are the reason that bean plants can produce nitrogen uh, from the air. It's actually the bacteria that are doing that for them, uh, with them. There are other examples of collaboration, the plant and uh, fungal exchanges, mycorrhizae. Uh, here's a shot of, or a diagram of, a plant root on the right-hand side with a spore of uh, a fungus on the outside. And the fungus has essentially branched a hyphen into the uh, into the root and inside the root has settled in two chambers uh, and these are places where the plant and the fungus exchange material so the plant can produce sugars and all sorts of things that the uh, the fungi really don't do so well and similarly the fungi can contribute elements to the plant uh, that help it be strong and successful. So the next thing is, let me just go back, I'm sorry. So this is why you want to be careful with various poisons, you know, uh, things that are like fungicides, or sometimes you'll need to apply those perhaps to, you know, the fungi in, in the top end of the plant to do so carefully and only after careful consideration of what your options are before you do that. And uh, similarly, things that kill microbes and microorganisms, the bulk of the uh, bulk of life in the soil is supported for the plants. It's not always the case, but uh, before you start adjusting the composition of the soil, do check out your options. Okay, garden site. There is good material on this subject in pretty much any gardening book, but uh, the key questions are, where's the sun? Are we, are we going to get good sunlight here through the course of the summer? Um, where's the water? Do you, do you have to, I, I had a garden when I was much younger where it was a community plot, but the nearest water was three blocks away. So we carried water to the garden. It wasn't ideal, but it was good enough. And um, if you can do better than that at home, it's a good idea to do so. Try to get the uh, try to get the hose close to the garden. Um, are you near trees? Trees have a root zone that is usually a bit wider than their uh, than their uh, drip line, and so you want to. If possible, stay away from trees because the trees are really, really good competitors. Um, I had a compost bin in the wrong place at one time and it filled up with maple roots. So by the time I went to see if I could get some compost out of that bin, the maple roots had pretty much taken all the freight. Try to keep away from buildings in, in Rhode Island. If your house was built after you know, 1978, then you're probably good. If your house is, you know, 100 years old, chances are good that it was painted with lead uh, paint at some point before it was banned in the late 70s. And so it's a it's good idea to get a soil test anyway in some of our older buildings. Um, and, uh, and just because there is the possibility of lead in the soil in an urban area in particular and if you have lead in your soil you can still plant on it but you need to put a barrier and a raised bed platform above that took a soil sample from a garden plant garden that came back with uh, lead levels that basically go with the epa warnings of don't let your children play anywhere near this soil. Um, so we, we don't want to put plants on there either. <clears throat> there are some plants that won't absorb it, some that will. But again, you don't, don't want to take chances with establishing a bed and then 
ending up with trouble. Right, so the other element of selecting a garden site, if you're just starting out, it's a good idea to maybe make one or two sort of four by eight size beds. You can get quite a lot of plants and production out of each of, you know, group of beds. Um, but if you start with too many beds, it may be just overwhelming as you try to get accustomed to the process of gardening over a season. So we offer through the Master Gardener uh, website, the uh, vegetable planting calendar. So on the left end of this, there's the list of vegetables or fruits. And then lo and behold, starting tomorrow, you could start indoors, I for indoor starts, celery or cabbage. And in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to put carrots and endive and things of that sort into the soil. And uh, similarly, March 1st is when we would start peas in the ground and spinach in the ground for the first time. And actually this year, you know, might have been able to start a bit earlier. Um, so this, this will give you pretty reasonable dates for starting seeds in the ground. That's what the S is for, uh, or starting seeds indoors so that you can later transplant them into the soil. So tomatoes being a big favorite and for some people the motivation for having a home garden, you would start them indoors anytime over the next couple of months, preferably not before the middle of March, because um, you don't want them to stay inside too long because they get leggy and, you know, uh, it's good to wait and then get them to the point that they're really ready to go into the ground when they go in. And tomatoes don't go in until after Memorial Day. And so, uh, yeah, there's a there's a process and a period. And again, in a gardening manual, they will tell you about how to plant the tomato, because typically with tomatoes, you remove the leaves from the bottom end of the stem and you plant them deeper than the actual root ball would have been. And that lets the plant generate roots from the stem that's buried and makes it much stronger and gives it much better access to soil resources than, than it would have without that. Okay. And uh, just going back one. No. Okay. Over on the far right side, there's the one example of vegetative uh, seeding, and that's garlic, which we plant um, sometime between Halloween and Thanksgiving. Good. Um, you'll need some tools, almost certainly. A spade and a fork, especially if you're breaking ground in a, in a new spot, um, you need weeders. And the objective with weeding is to remove the top of the weed at an early stage. Um, the Once your vegetable plants start sending out roots, uh, pulling a plant out, pulling a weed plant out by its roots uh, risks damage to the root that the vegetable is growing. So what what we try to do with weeders is to cut them off near the top, near the crown of the plant, leave the roots in place. They may try to put up another uh, sprout, but, but generally there, you balance the risk um, with that. And there are lots of weeders available now that will help you scrape the top surface of the soil to remove weeds. Um, the uh, the consideration is how far apart are your plants? Um, if you're growing carrots, you know, you've, you've either planted them in triangle patterns, in which case there's enough space to get, you know, a small weeding uh, scraper 
through the maze. Um, and if you're planting them in rows, then you have probably left more space, uh, though the, the individual uh, radishes or whatever it is, uh, plants are closer together, but you can get really close to that line uh, with a with a standing up hoe. Uh, anyway, you need to be able to, to weed the plant beds, uh, especially by early July. A pruning tool, you've probably seen, probably own uh, bypass pruners um, that help you make clean cuts pruning cuts are why they're called pruners if you're if you're grafting if you're pruning trees um the tomato plants benefit from pruning of uh, volunteer shoots that start in a leaf axle uh, they're called suckers or things of that sort if you can get them when they're really small you can pinch them out if they get to be big you need to to clip them and uh, for harvesting fruits, pruners are really helpful. Soil prep tool of uh, one sort or another. Um, you know, we use rakes, we use uh, digging tools. Um, we need, uh, there's, uh, there are various shapes of trowel. There's a garden knife that acts as a trowel but also is a, an implement that makes uh, slits in the soil. So as you go, you, you'll probably get a sense of what it is you're trying to do that you can't quite do. And that's a good time to think about what sort of tools might be available to help you. Uh, and there are a lot of good sources for tools in local shops, hardware stores increasingly um, are carrying garden materials and tools and uh, the seed suppliers are easy places to find these things. So a hose or watering can for irrigation, some gloves every now and then you need to pull on things that might hurt you uh, or which are unpleasant to hang on to. Uh, but the roses are you know, sort of a classic example. Uh, labels. It's so important to keep things labeled. It's just, especially in the seed stage, because you just have no idea when you go out a few days later whether you're remembering correctly, because once they start to grow, they look different. So labels, twine, sometimes helpful, and a little rain gauge ad hoc, uh, you know, can and a pencil or a ruler is good. And a notebook is very helpful. Um, because after your first season, you're going to need to look at rotations. Uh, and you can look at rotations when you make your plan for your first season with an eye to, you know, taking the two beds that you may have and growing one group of vegetables in this one and one group in the other one, excuse me, and then next year switch them, right? And there are three-year rotations and four-year rotations and all sorts of things. And the point of rotation is that some plants just take a lot out of the soil and other plants are gentler feeders and even add things to the soil. And uh, moving plants that are subject to pests uh, is a good idea. So if you, if you plant a tomato over here, and last year you planted them over here when the uh, insects rise out of the soil where those tomatoes were last year, they're gone, which is an ideal arrangement for a gardener. Um, different pests have different profiles. The, the meanest of them probably is the squash vine borer, um, which essentially digs into the uh, stems of the of the plants and deposits its eggs there and then um, when those eggs hatch and the pupae start to uh, chew on the internal part of the plant the vine just sort of goes uh, mushy and doesn't help anymore in producing fruit uh, the number of ways of getting by that uh, late planting uh, you know, encouraging downstream rooting of, of uh, the plant as it goes. 
but you can't actually avoid the uh, presence of the borer because uh, even if they don't rise under your plant, um, if they rise in your neighbor's plot, you know, they, they can fly up to five miles. So there you know, is often good information about when they're hatching and you can plant things later. Uh, anyway, some years is not too bad even. There's lots more about gardening. Sorry, sorry for the diversion there. Um, and a daily visit to the garden is really helpful. It's actually good for you. And uh, it's good for your garden and the plants. You can check the water. Uh, you may need to do a fertilization program where you pay attention to plants. If you, again, if you, if you read descriptions of the plants in a garden guide uh, or on the back of the seed packet even, um, it will give you information about what to do to care well for these plants. And uh, often there are uh, recommendations for how to fertilize, what to use in this mix of fertilizer for this particular plant and what frequency. Uh, now, after you checked all of these things, try to make some notes because those will be really valuable to you in uh, coming years. And then just watch what's happening. And it's a good idea to have a bench, a place to sit in, uh, in your garden. So once you get started, you probably will really uh, enjoy this. And uh, well, there we are. That's Wonderful. It. Well, I want to thank Bill for giving us this very informational presentation today. And I want to thank all of you for attending as well. Um, I hope you learned something new today and are ready to start your vegetable gardens this year. It will be very exciting. Mm -hmm.